Hi, how are you doing? This is JC Sum. Welcome to episode 8 of the Illusion Breakdown series. It's all happening right now. This is the final episode. Uh, thank you so much if you've been joining in all this while. Uh, eight weeks that we've been doing. And this is the final episode on illusions and mentalism. All right, you're probably thinking, what's this you know, episode all about? Really, it's about exploring performing illusions with a mentalism presentation or you might call it a psychological illusions of the mind sort of presentation. Now, purists might call this mental magic and not mentalism. I know there's a distinction. Uh, purists consider mentalism using pure techniques. Mental magic is magic, uh, which maybe has a kind of a mentalism uh, presentation, but it may use props or it may use gimmicks or may use certain things which they don't consider pure. Now, from a trade distinction, or if you're talking from the pure uh, understanding within the community, sure, understand there may be a difference between mentalism and mental magic. To the lay audience, honestly, there's no difference. You know, it's, it's still not pure, because if you talk about pure mentalism, yes, some people talk about NLP, the using of suggestion, the way you word things. Now, if you really read someone's mind or you really influence them with your words and your gestures, you don't use any kind of deception or trickery to create a result, whether it's a prediction to read someone's mind, you know, it's still, you're using a deceptive technique. You aren't doing the real thing. So it's still, you know, a form of magic. So when purists say, oh, you're using you know, this sort of gimmick, it's, that's not considered real mentalism. Real mentalism uses much more pure techniques. You know, the fact that you use a thumb writer, index of cards, a gimmick book or gimmick envelopes, gimmick clipboard, these are still gimmicks. These are still utilities, tools to create an illusion that you're reading someone's mind or creating a prediction. And to me, there's no difference from a magician illusionist using a box to make a girl or a tiger appear you're still using utilities no matter how ingenious no matter how innocent the prop may look like it is still a gimmick or a device to aid in creating the illusion of achieving the effect and that is what mentalism or mental magic is and to me that's generally the case as long as you're using a gimmick or some deception to create an illusion of a psychological illusion, it is still a piece of magic. Call it mentalism if you like, call it mental magic. To me, it makes no difference. I'm using the word mental magic or mentalism here interchangeably in my presentation and how I approach uh, mental magic. Of course, I do marvel at the more, more pure techniques, but really it's like saying, you know, pure card magic produces slights are much better than, you know, using a gimmick. So what happens if you use both? where you use the aid of a double backer, which is a gimmick, and you use slides. You know, the argument can go on forever, but for the purposes of a commercial audience, and for you, if you're a commercial a magician performing commercial shows, or even if you're just per not performing it for money, but you're performing for a lay audience, not necessarily just pure mentalists or for industry people like within a magic convention, you know, I personally think there's no real big difference, and you shouldn't be caught up too much in having a difference of be caught up with trying to do anything pure. Because as long as you use a deceptive technique, it's not pure. Okay, so when you think about illusionists, you don't think so much about mentalism. Mentalism generally is seen as maybe a close-up parlor or stage sort of presentation. You don't really think here of a mental illusionist unless he's crazy. But I think there's a place for illusions for mentalism presentation or mental illusions, whatever you want to call it because it adds for a very interesting presentation within a whole show. If you have a whole show of visual grand illusion where you're cutting someone in half, making them vanish, you know, disappear, mutilate them, floating something, something which has texture, which has a mentalism presentation, a psychological slant, can be very different for the audience. It can offer a different perspective of performing illusions, it adds variety to your show. And the great thing, of course, a lot of these presentations tend to be more long or longer simply because you have to set it up with a pattern or script. So they tend to be longer and they can fill time in the show. That's always useful if you're doing a show. 
So there are many benefits of doing illusions on large scale stage presentations with a mentalism presentation. Uh, let's give some examples uh, that you know I just thought of as well as uh, took note of. If you watch the movie, Now You See Me, the first movie, you had uh, Jesse Eisenberg with his, he did a street magic effect, but basically he did the whole force, had you, you know the audience, and I believe the people at home also kind of cite the card. Then he had a building behind, this was a night scene, so he had a, dark, or he had a building behind, and basically he snapped, all the lights changed, lights went out, and basically the suit and the value of the card were left on the building. So that's basically just the revelation of a card trick, but played up to be really big. In this case, it's on the street, but using the whole facade of the building. That's really a, almost an illusion, or practically an illusion because of the scale. So that's an example of illusion with the mentalism presentation. Of course, that was done for street, that was done for TV, but you understand what I'm, uh, what I'm saying, that was done for film. And you can bring this to stage. So if on stage, you can make a small card trick have a really big revelation, making it seem you know, bigger than it is. Because when I think about illusion presentations, I think about scale, production value. So if you could have, uh, yeah, you could have LED backdrop, right? Showing a night scene and a thought of card appears on the screen, filling it up and you know, using effects and motion graphics with live pyrotechnics and smoke that can create a very strong effect or revelation for the audience. So it's almost like an illusion revelation, even though it's a mentalism presentation. I think the floating table, and I did this uh, when I did a mentalism show, maybe I should share a bit of background. I, you know, while I'm an illusionist, uh, I started out with close-up magic, a stand-up show, and after 10 years of performing, I finally decided to try mentalism. Because I've always felt right from the start that mentalism requires a lot of confidence, a lot of gravitas, and a lot of experience as a performer to deliver it well. Because it requires the audience to believe in what you're doing. You're presenting a psychological illusion. You need credibility. And I never felt that, you know, at least for myself, as a young performer, I have that ability to give credibility to a mentalism presentation because I was just too young, I was just too green as a performer. I didn't have that seasoned feel, whether it's the way I talk, the way I look at the audience, or just how I present myself over on stage. So I never felt that I could present mentalism until I had some years of experience under my belt. So after about 10 years of performing, I got heavy into mentalism. I got all the books. Uh, I studied the techniques, and we talk about the pure techniques, and I kind of combined them with the mental magic techniques and illusion techniques, and I created an interactive illusion show. I called it Illusions of the Mind, although I did sell it as a mentalism show at the time. And I did it for about one half years professionally. It went well, it did well, but not at the level I think it should have. I, I felt I didn't do justice to the material myself, but I did really, you know, went hardcore into it. And I let it go for about another six or seven years before I revisited it. And when I did revisit it, I didn't call it Mentalism Show simply because the brand as illusionist was very strong. So I called it an interactive illusion show. But basically, between you and I, you know, it's still a mental magic show or mental illusion show. But I call it an interactive illusion show just so that's closer to my branding. And it went very well. I still do a version of that uh, when it calls upon. Or I do put one or two of the routines in a longer show when I need to. So I, I tell you this just to show you or to demonstrate that I have have had a lot of experience, you know, thinking about the routines, learning the craft, the mentalism craft, and producing it into a real show. And that's where the floating table comes in. Now most magicians would perform it as a piece of magic. I presented the floating table uh, in the illusion of the mind, illusions of the mind show, the mentalism show, and I presented it as more of a um, telekinetic type of presentation. You know, it's the illusion of the mind. I'm, I'm gonna move it with my mind. So I did the floating table as more of a mentalism effect rather than visual magic piece. The benefit, of course, it was a visual piece, so that was great. That was exactly what I wanted in the middle of my show. But when I presented it, you know, it was about concentration, about, you know, moving the table of the mind. 
So in fact, for the first one minute of the routine, it was really about pure concentration and it was really about really floating to the table only by you know, six inches off the ground. And then I animated it, but still very slowly. It was never a jerky action. And I personally, I hate that. Even when I see magicians do it as a stage magic piece, I hate the flying table. It's the floating table. Look at the original Lazander version. It is supposed to float. It's supposed to just glide in the air. And if you are directing it or somehow giving it power to move, it should still be slow and elegant. I hate the jerky actions or the fast motions. But back to the mentalism presentation. But because I presented it as a mentalism routine or presentation, it had to move slow. Because I had so much effort to float this table. And then I would float it around the stage just for a while and I'll end the routine. The psychology I put on it was really like the original animated bill that John Kennedy came came up with you know he came up with the whole floating bill premise but he he started the animated floating bill so the idea was really to make it float only for a few seconds it was of believability the whole routine was based on animation somehow it moves on the fingertips it, it you know it just moves around and then at the end it floats creating that kind of a kicker effect or that, that punch to the routine so i adapted that kind of approach and thinking to the animated floating bill as I did for the floating table. But that's an example of an illusion with a mentalism presentation. You might see some performers do a hangman presentation where they will set up the gallows or trap doors and do kind of a hangman sack where they would you know, put bags over their head uh, and different people at the pool levers or levers are chosen and, and they would try to escape. Now, some people would really drop down, but nothing will happen. Some people might disappear and vanish and reappear behind the audience. Now, pure mentalists will hate a presentation like that. I personally have no problem with it. If you build up the premise and people believe that you're really there and they, there are stakes when the levers are pulled, to me, you have achieved that mentalism presentation. And the vanish and reappearance is just a kicker. I think that's a great routine. You could also do various Russian roulette routines. And again, this is really if you want to do it yourself. I know some people hate the smash and stab. You don't have to do that. Same with guns or arrows. It's up to you. But it is just an example of using a large scale routine as a mentalism presentation. Or that is really just a backdrop for an illusion presentation. Speaking of hangmans or Russian roulettes, you could have the gulletin illusions, the French gulletin prop. This is an illusion prop where it's a giant gulletin and basically someone's head can be placed in and the blade can drop and it apparently just passes through the person's neck. And it can, in some versions, it can chop a carrot, depending on how big the version is. But essentially, that's it. Now, you could create a giant version of that uh, with a mentalism presentation. Either you could have multiple gulletins where you have maybe dummies and three of them and a spectator and yourself with one of them and all of them drop except one. Or you could have one big gulletin with maybe four ropes and each of the ropes are connected to the lever. And again, one is chosen, so three are pulled and one is not dropped and you're safe. Or maybe the final one does drop and nothing happens. It's up to you. You have to think of uh, exact presentation. I'm just talking off the top of my head, but you get what I mean. You can look at some illusions and traditional mental magic or even just pure magic routines and give it a mental presentation to make it big and make it interesting. I do a chair test in my Illusions of the Mind show. And just to give you an idea, most mentalist purists would just use any chair from the venue. I don't. I bring my own chairs because I have a specific way I wanted the chairs to look, to be consistent. I also color coded the chairs so that. Uh, they are all different as part of my presentation. And I also end up with a prediction in a prediction chest as well. So it, it definitely doesn't pack small. <laughs> it, play, it packs actually quite big. But it also plays big. And uh, it looks great on stage. And I have consistency as a performer. I know exactly how the props look like, how to handle the props. Uh, there are no surprises for me. You can do prediction revelations with a giant revelation. I gave the example of the movie, Now You See Me, with the card revelation, with the lights of the office building. 
Uh, two examples in recent time, uh, Jimmy Raven did it on Britain's Got Talent. Uh, he had you know, a series of effects, but one of it was a prediction effect with a helicopter, and he made a real helicopter appear. Liu Tian, Taiwanese magician, he did something similar on China TV. He had basically uh, various items picked from an iPad. It was kind of like a shopping excursion where different items were picked. He showed an empty platform framework, and he made you know, two girls in outfits and a motorcycle appear because these were the items chosen. So really, they are illusion presentations, the appearance of a large object shrouded with an illusion uh, a mentalism presentation, and it made for really good TV, good presentations, it's ent entertaining, you can engage the audience, there's the you know, choosing of the items, uh, you can always have a byplay, it allows you to showcase your personality, your character, and you know, it's just interesting for the audience because uh, they don't really know what's going on, they may think, hey, this is a traditional presentation or mentalism, mind reading effect, but there's a payoff. A very visual payoff. One last example I'd like to mention is Copperfields. Uh, one of the routines he did in his Explosive Encounter special. This is a beautiful piece where he showed a crowbar, a book of matches, and a light bulb. They were examined by the audience and they were placed on stage on individual tables across the entire stage. And after he introduced the various items and they were placed on the stand, he introduced the routine, music played, the lights went down, focusing on each of the tables, each of the objects. And he basically went, he bent the crowbar, he made the matches you know, light up by themselves and burn. Finally, he went to the light bulb, you know, made it turn on by itself, eventually went bright, it went dim, went bright, and finally, it burst. And that is obviously a perfect presentation in the sense that the lighting, the music, all fit his actions, the mood, and the effects. Pure mentalists would hate this because it's overproduced. And it's obvious to an audience that, oh, this can't be a psychological illusion because it's all too perfect and too produced. Yes, it is, but it looked great. It felt great. It was an amazing piece of magic. It's one of, my, it's one of the things that stood out to me of the entire special, just because of the presentation, the way it was built up, and then the very beautiful theatrical presentation. So these are all examples of what I consider illusions with mentalism presentations. You give the illusions a context, a context or presentation of a psychological presentation, and you add in theatrical production value, whether it's in the form of staging, sets, lighting, and music. Uh, and I think that really these elements combined with the mentalism premise is really very strong for an illusion presentation. Now, if you are uh, an amateur performer, I mean amateur not in terms of skills, but I just mean in terms of uh, performing. If you perform professionally or commercially for money, then you're more of a professional performer. But if you perform generally for fun, for your friends, yes, a purist route might make more sense for you and I'd agree, uh, you might not uh, want to do illusions with a mentalism presentation. You'd rather just do mentalism you know, straight. Totally agree with you. And if that's what you like to do, no one should say otherwise. That's what you want to do. But if you're a commercial entertainer you know, who charges for shows and you're serious about you know, getting good money for your shows, production value is very important for a show. So even if you're a mentalist, you aren't an illusionist. You're a mentalist or you're a stage magician who does some mentalism routines in the show. You can benefit from production value, from lighting, from staging, the choice of props, what you bring to the stage. Clients do recognize this, and you can pay, you can get paid more because you bring this production value to the stage. Totally agree. Showmanship, presentation, entertainment value is very important. But all things being equal, if one guy brings just a couple of envelopes, a table, chairs from the banquet rooms, a marker, a flip chart, and you bring you know, expensive, elaborate looking props, I can guarantee you, you can nine out of 10 times command a higher fee, all things being equal, if they can provide you the staging and technical requirements.
because people will pay for a spectacle. Think about concerts. You know, if you talk about the top music artists in the world, from the vocal ability point of view, all of them are great. All of them are talented. If you talk about songs, popularity of songs, they're all number one top billboard charting artists. So they're all great. So the difference comes in the production value. The production value of their concert. They bring in multiple dancers, have 20 costume changes, LED walls, you know, supporting sets, all sorts of things, product, you know, pyrotechnics, smoke machines, confetti launches, whatever, you, you name it, they have it. And it's all in the bid, you know, to justify a, a higher fee and to give the audience an experience. And I believe that a mentalism or illusion show with a mentalism presentation can benefit with more production value. But it, that is just my point of view. Well, another reason is if you perform illusions and you add in a mentalism presentation, it's good variety for the show. You know, a show, any, no matter how good, any show with the same sort of presentation, not texture, any long show, say 30 minutes and more, if you don't have variety, you don't have texture, it still can get monotonous. Uh, you need to have a dramatic structure in your show. And you know you need to build interest curves. Generally, your curve would, of course, go up. You're going to start off and build up to the end, but there still has to be some variation in your curve, even though it builds up. And the reason, again, is you need to give breathers to your audience. You need variety for them to rest, because magic is an intellectual thinking art. It's very hard for people just to try to concentrate hard all the time. So a mentalism presentation allows for a breather because normally you have to set up the premise. You have to introduce either the props or the plot of the routine. This allows the audience to breathe from any wham bam illusions you might have done. This also allows you, as I mentioned earlier, to engage the audience, to showcase your personality, your character, get the audience to know you as you develop the plot of the presentation of the routine. So all these are benefits for your show. These routines tend to be longer, so you fill time. So if you're doing a longer show, that's great as well because you get to fill time. And you know, professional performers will know these are all helpful. You don't want to drag time for the sake of dragging time, but you definitely will have some routines which are shorter and you want some routines which are longer. Again, not just to fill time, but also for texture and for dramatic variety. And if you perform for a mixed crowd, let's say you perform for a resort or theme park, and you have audiences as young as four to 94, you have a really wide range of audience. It's tough to do a pure mentalism show. So if you do an illusion show, a magic show with a mentalism presentation, but you ensure you have visual elements, as I mentioned, the floating table, talked about how Copperfield did his bending crowbar, the lighting of the matches and the bulb. All these are very visual elements. So even if people are too young, too old, or maybe uh, they don't even speak the same language as you, so they don't they didn't follow the mentalism presentation, they still can appreciate and enjoy the payoff because now they see, wow, a floating table. They see you know, a bulb light up. So maybe they can infer what the presentation or the build up was, but at least they get a payoff, they get the magical effect and they can appreciate that. So if you perform in venues or events which have a very mixed crowd, performing a show which has a combination of the psychological illusions as well as the visual aspects of the illusion can be beneficial. So that's really my take when it comes to presenting illusions with a mentalism presentation or to flip it on the side, presenting mentalism illusions, bearing in mind illusion techniques and illusion production value. I do believe that is, you know, it's good to meet halfway to get the best of both worlds. And I'm never saying, you know, sacrifice the technique or the effect just for scale. No, I'm not saying that. If the best way to do the effect is for you to memorize a deck and to do a classic force, then you do that. But it can be enhanced with production value on top of doing those more pure techniques. So yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying take the easy way out. I'm saying there's a marriage between production value, visual, theatrical effects with a psychological mentalism presentation. Now, if you'd like to 
see some of my ideas. I do have a book called Illusionism, which shares illusions and large scale effects exactly uh, based on the approach and the premise that I've been talking about for the past you know, 30 minutes. So if you'd like to have a look at that a collection of original illusions from uh, you know, glass breaking effects to psychometric effects to giant revelations, I've also got multiple effect presentations. Taking the cue from Copfield's three-phase routine, I do have a routine where a, uh, there's a spoon bending phase, a block of wood moves, and then there's a glass breaking effect. So many different mentalism effects, some with even a comedy presentation as well, but it's called illusionism. So my creative way of combining illusions with mentalism. Now you can find that on the illusionbookstore.com and actually I'm running a discount right now till the weekend. So if you're watching this live, you have a couple of days to check that out at discounted price. If not, you know, thank you so much. This is the final episode of the Illusion Breakdown series for season one at least. Uh, thanks for tuning in and for free Illusion plans, if you haven't subscribed yet, so you have even more free content, you know, subscribe to illusionbooks.com. If you'd like to check out Illusionism or any other product, check out illusionbookstore.com. My name is JC Sell. Thank you for joining in. I hope to see you on stage.